Welcome everyone to Calvary Church of Annapolis. My name is Conrad Link and we're delighted you're with us in worship this day on the second Sunday of our Lenten season. As I welcomed you to our worship today, I want you to notice my stole. It's draped around my neck. It has some symbols of the Lenten season. First, it's the color purple, symbolic of repentance. Secondly, it has three nails, the nails for the hands of Jesus and one for his feet. It has a symbol of the crown of thorns placed upon his head as he walked through the city streets of Jerusalem. And then it has the cross. And on the cross is a drape. And that drape, tradition has it, was used to lower Jesus after his death from the cross. And that drape was then used as part of his shroud to wrap him in a time of burial. Join with us now in our worship today as we focus on listening to God. Come on now, let's join in worship and listen for God and to God. Let's go.
Join with me now in our community prayer of confession on this second Sunday in Lent. Gracious God, you reached into Abraham and Sarah's lives and asked them to dream the impossible dream, that you would transform what appears to have been a barren and lifeless situation into one overflowing with promise and hope. And through faith in you, they believed your promises. Forgive us, O oh God, if we never get beyond thinking of your call in our lives as an impossible dream or even as an unwelcome interruption. Forgive us, O oh God, when we find it hard to hear your promises above commercial assurances of transformation, promises tempting us to trust the newest and trendiest product to realize our dreams. Forgive us, O oh God, when we allow the power of evil to flourish because we fear that taking up one's cross would be just too costly an exercise. Forgive our lack of trust in you. Give us the courage to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Join with me now in these words of assurance and pardon. Faith has reckoned as righteousness to us who believe in the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death because of our sins and was raised for the sake of our righteousness. Hear and believe these words about God's amazing grace as forgiveness of sins. Amen. Believe in the good news of Christ's love and Christ's amazing grace. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. First scripture lesson today is from Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. When Abram was 90 years old, plus 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me 
and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be the father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson today is from Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that, saying openly, and Peter took him and he began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But who shall ever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever, therefore, shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him shall also be the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
So I want to tell you about an experience I had a couple of months ago. It was a beautiful uh, fall day, and I decided this was the day that I was going to walk the Navy Bridge. So I changed my shoes, put on my hiking shoes, got my backpack, put my camera in the backpack, got a bottle of water, walked out of the parsonage, walked through the neighborhood, across the, the street and started going down the path towards the sidewalk of the Navy Bridge. And as I got closer, you know, you got to be aware of the traffic because there's a lot of traffic in that area. And I was walking along and started up the, off the bridge and wanted to get to the crest of the bridge so that I could pull my camera out and take some photographs of some of the last of the season sailors as they went up and down the river. And as I got to the crest and I put my backpack down and stood there in the quiet of the moment, I was uh, absolutely amazed that the quiet of the moment wasn't really quiet at all, that that bridge is a very noisy bridge. I mean, you hear the driving back and forth of cars, and not only that, it's the hum of the road, and not only that, the bridge actually has ridges within the concrete of the pavement, so there's even an extra sound that comes when the cars come driving by with their sound and the sound of the road, and then this rumbling sound as they across uh, these various strips or grooves in the road, and it's amazingly loud. Plus, when you're down by the water, it's a little more calm than you are up in the crest of the bridge, and there's noise of the wind, and all of a sudden, you realize that in an attempt to find quiet, you are overwhelmed with noise. Today in our sermon, in our worship today, we're talking about the power that you and I have to pause and listen to God, listen for God, listen for the voice of God, and how difficult that is because we live in a very noisy world. Matter of fact, Henry Nouwen, a wonderful author and priest, talks about how we listen not just with our ears, but listen with our heart and how important it is to try to pause in our faith life to listen to the voice of Jesus speaking to our heart. And Jesus speaks with a very first intimate voice. He doesn't shout at us. He doesn't yell at us. He doesn't thrust himself upon us. He has an unassuming voice that's quiet, almost a near whisper. And to hear that near whisper voice through scripture and music and song and meditation requires a certain sense of calm and quiet to come over us. The difficulty with all that is that we live in a noisy and restless world where chaos and clamor and sound is constantly beating at our heads, at our ears, at our minds. And to remove ourselves from that noise, we need to, but it's sometimes hard to do. The first thing I would like you to learn today is, if you want to pray, you first have to listen. If you want to speak to God, the first thing you have to do is listen. If you want to understand what God is saying to you or how God is acting in the world, the first thing you have to do is listen. The scripture for the day from the Gospel of Mark is a curious scripture. It doesn't really happen very often. But here we have a fascinating insight into the voice and the life of God through Jesus that we want to just pause for a moment and focus on. So here's the setting of the Gospel from Mark. Jesus is speaking to the crowd. He's speaking to the crowd about the purpose of the Son of Man. That's the way he refers to himself as the Son of Man. And he says the Son of Man must suffer. The Son of Man must undergo persecution. The Son of Man must be ridiculed by leaders, by scribes, by the chief priests, by the Pharisees, by the religious leaders. He must be rejected by those same people. Jesus goes on to say that the Son of Man must do this all in public and be rejected by all these people, and then eventually the Son of Man will be killed, and then after three days rise from the dead. Well, he says this in a very public arena. Here's what's 
curious about this. After he says this, Peter, the apostle Peter, actually calls Jesus away from the crowd, pulls him off to the side, and you ready for this? Peter rebukes Jesus. He criticizes Jesus. Hey, Jesus, don't say these things. People are going to get angry with you. Hey, don't say these things in public. People are going to be really upset with you saying that all these religious leaders are going to turn against you. Peter rebukes Jesus. Peter criticizes Jesus for speaking about what's going to take place. Well, that moment switches because then all of a sudden Jesus rebukes Peter. And those are the words that we know profoundly from the Scripture where Jesus says to Peter, Hey, get behind me. He calls him Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Stop saying all these things about what I'm supposed to do according to your definition. Stop obstructing my message to the people. And then Jesus says, after he has rebuked Peter, if you want to be my follower, if you want to be the follower of the Son of Man, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. If you're trying to save your life, you will lose it. But if you follow me by losing your life to your own aspirations, you will find it. And then this is the part I want you to listen to. Jesus says, of what profit is it that you gain all the riches of the world but lose your soul? And again he says, do not be ashamed of what I, Jesus, the Son of Man, says. Can you listen? Can you hear? Sometimes when we hear a scripture, we're confronted by the first part, and we, we hear the story, in this case, of the rebuking of Peter of Jesus and Jesus of Peter, and that, that, gets, that gets in our way because it's what comes after that that we really need to listen to and hear. And what we really need to listen to and hear is Jesus says to us, don't be ashamed of what the Son of Man says. Don't be ashamed of who I am. And follow me. Don't be afraid to follow me and pick up your cross. Don't be afraid to recognize that the world says that you profit and live according to this standard. But I say live according to another standard. Listen, listen, listen. Where do you go to listen? Where are you comfortable to listen? What do you do in order to put yourself in a situation that you might listen to God? You know, I, I, I hate to have a gender bias here, but I think sometimes men, young men in particular, but men in general, have a hard time being quiet and listening. I think men are all about hunting and gathering and fishing and protecting and getting out and doing all those things. And sitting and pausing and listening and reflecting is some kind difficult for them. I'm not saying men are the only one. Women have a difficult time sitting still too. I mean, after all, the Bible has a wonderful story about Mary and Martha, about these two sisters where Jesus comes to visit them and Martha is all about doing stuff. She wants to provide hospitality and she's busy moving all around the house, doing all kinds of stuff, preparing all things, cleaning all things, doing all kinds of stuff. She's so busy that in her attempt to be hospitable to Jesus, she actually ignores Jesus because she's so busy doing all these other things that she thinks she needs to do to take care of him. Versus Mary, who's just simply present to Jesus and listening to Jesus. And Martha scolds Mary for not getting up and helping more. And Jesus, for a brief moment, chooses Mary's side and says, just, just listen. Just be present. Just pause. Just reflect. Where do you go to be quiet? What do you do to quiet yourself? What do you do to just listen? John Wesley talks about having a heart strangely warm that in the midst of a large experience, 
he found himself alone and isolated and felt this warmness come over him as it was the presence of God that in the midst of a crowd he could sense the presence of God. The Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, the ninth chapter, has an experience of God that God literally knocks him off a horse to slow him down, to make him stop and listen, blinds him temporarily so that he will listen to the word and voice of God. Elijah has to go up onto a mountaintop and battle prophets of Baal. And he's trying to figure out where God is in all this prophet. And he discovers that God is present to him in the still, small, quiet voice of the moment. Daniel, in the fifth chapter of his book, sees that God is not in all the clamor, but in the quiet writing of a mysterious finger writing words on a wall. That both Elijah and Elisha experience God in a vision but only if they stop and see and listen were they able to pick up on the vision of God being present to them. Elizabeth and Mary in the Gospel of Luke have to pause and listen for the voice of God. And even in 1 Samuel chapter 3, the voice of God simply speaks one word, a name, and God is heard. Where do you go to listen to God. What are you willing to do? What are you willing to change to listen to God? A few years ago, I got a phone call from a caregiver. She was the caregiver of a man, let's just, just call his name Joe. That's not his real name. Joe was uh, in hospice and dying, and, and he didn't have any family, and this caregiver had brought him into her house and was caring for him in the last few weeks or months of his life. And uh, Joe all of a sudden became very restless. Uh, the only medicines he was having was a small little pain medicine, and that really wasn't really affecting his life. He'd been on that a long time, but he became agitated. And finally, he told the caregiver that uh, he began having visions, uh, experience. It was as though uh, uh, a spiritual presence was in the room, in the corner of the room, and, and sometimes was even very present to him at the end of his bed, and it made him quite fearful and agitated and asleep. And, and she tried to understand what he was talking about. It didn't make any sense to her. And physically, uh, certain nights, he would, he would hear him speaking and being restless and he was asleep, but he was having some kind of nightmare, but he didn't wake up. And and so she asked me if I would come and listen to him as he explained his dream. And, and so I did. And for a number of weeks, I sat next to him in his bed, and we tried to recount. And I tried to ask him questions that would reveal what he was seeing in his vision. And we, we talked about this mysterious presence that at one time was in the corner of the room, and that didn't really trouble him as much, although he was aware of the presence. And then Periodically, it would come down and be on the, the end of the bed, and that troubled him. It was getting closer, and, and I, I was starting to say to Joe, well, why don't you just listen and ask a question like, who are you, and what do you want? And just ask this over and over again. See if you could do that in your thinking. And, and over again, a period of weeks, we, uh, we talked, and and he said, you know, I think last night I did ask uh, who they were and what did they want. And I said, well, did they answer you? And he said, no, I don't remember a, an answer, but was there anything different? Well, he said, yeah, all of a sudden the, the spirit wasn't in the corner of the room, was very present at the end of the bed. And it, it was fearful, but if I kept saying, who are you, what do you want, the spirit stayed still and just kind of hovered, and, and it became less scary. And so we created a, more of a list of questions. Uh, who are you? What do you want? Do I know you? Shall I listen to you? What shall I see? And, and as we went over these days, he began to be more calm and quiet, and the caregiver began to say, do you know that I could hear there was some mumbling going on, but he wasn't, he wasn't as agitated as he had been. And, 
And finally, after a period of time, I said to Joe, so what happened? He said, well, you know, the more I asked questions and I didn't get any answer, the clearer the vision became. And I think it was, I think it was my wife. And it became clearer and clearer. And, and as I began to recognize the person, I wasn't as scared. And I, I listened, but nobody said anything. And I didn't say anything. I think, I think she smiled. And I think, I think I smiled back, but I, I think she smiled. And I said, did that bring you a sense of peace? He says, yes, I didn't need to ask questions anymore. I didn't, I didn't need to hear anything. I could just see her. And the vision stopped. And Joe became more peaceful in his sleep, less agitated. And he died just a couple of weeks later, very quiet, very calm, very peaceful. Joe wasn't much of a religious person. But his wife, who had died a number of years before, was the only family he'd ever had, never had any children. It was just him and her. And he was lost. But she brought him a sense of calm. Where do you go? What do you do to listen to God? What, what is needed for you to have a quiet moment with God? What is keeping you what is keeping you from having a quiet moment with God? What, what needs to get out of the way in your life so that you can have a quiet moment with God? I'm not talking about always having a quiet moment in a dream or a vision or on top of a bridge or anything. It's each individual person needs to find that place that works for them for a few moments. It could be five minutes. It could be ten minutes. It doesn't have to be a long period of time that just for a moment you pause and listen for God. What noise or distraction or practice or event or situation or person or barrier needs to get out of the way so that you can have a quiet listening moment to God? Are you your own barrier to listening to God? Are you worried that God won't hear you, therefore you don't want to have a moment to listen to God? Are you worried that God will hear you? Are you worried that God will change you or want to change you? What is keeping you from listening to God? What is keeping you from listening to God? And will you, once listening to God, tell God what is on your mind, on your heart? in your life, what you're worried about, what you hope for, what you dream for, what you desire. During this Lenten season, let's pause and listen as a first step in prayer and listen to God, listen for God, and respond. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, help us to listen for you and to you. Help us have a moment, a minute, five minutes, sometime each day that we simply breathe and allow your presence to be with us and near us. Open our hearts and our minds and our ears to listen to you and to respond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to that part of our service where we return our tithes and offerings, let's continue to focus on the image of listening. As we prepare to give our gifts, let us hear this prayer of listening. 
O Lord, we come this day and every day, knee bowed and body bent before your grace. O Lord, we come to you this day like empty pitchers to be filled with the fountain of your love. As you have blessed us with bounty in the past, so let us share of our bounty as we listen to your call on our lives. Bless both the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Join with me in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
We come now to the end of our service. May God continue to bless you as you listen with your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength to the presence of God in your life and in our world. Join us next week as we continue our journey during this Lenten season, listening, listening, listening. Next week we'll focus on listening to our neighbor. May God bless and keep you now and always. Amen.